Good morning, and you're very welcome to this morning's Signpost webinar. We hope you're keeping safe and well wherever you're joining us from today. Pollinators, we know, provide a vital ecosystem service to the agricultural industry, but are we doing enough to help our pollinators and the wider biodiversity on farms across the country? Today, we're joined by Ruth Wilson, Farmland Pollinator Officer from the National Biodiversity Data Centre, working on the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan, and Dr. Catherine Keena, a Countryside Management Specialist with Chagask, and also a member of the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan Steering Committee. Ruth and Catherine, you're very welcome to this morning's webinar. How are you, Mark? Hi. Nice to be here. Great. Um, so, Catherine, uh, thanks for joining us this morning. You're going to help us with the questions later on and and uh, some of the answers as well, hopefully, uh, mm -hmm. because we uh, we uh, this is a very topical area. And uh, so, Ruth, maybe you could just introduce yourself uh, to to our audience this morning and and uh, some background on yourself, maybe. Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me for the invitation to speak today. And I'm the Farmland Pollinator Officer with the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, and that's implemented through the National Biodiversity Data Centre, um, based out of Waterford. Um, and my role really um, is they realise that we realise how important farmland is for our pollinators and to wider biodiversity. And so it's a very interesting role and just uh, to engage with farmers as much as possible. Um, I was previously a biodiversity officer with a local authority, um, but uh, I, I grew up on a farm. So um, that was really uh, what drew me into the post. So, um, Great. So, so you have a, a deep understanding of, of the, the cycles of what happens on, at a farm level. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the early mornings, of course, as well. Um, and the late evenings. And the late evenings, indeed. Um, so, so Ruth, um, if you could maybe share your presentation with us there, you're going to give us some practical uh, tips on, on, on what farmers can do on their farms to, uh, to improve biodiversity. Um, but just while you're doing that, to remind everybody that uh, you can send us your questions uh, through the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen, and we'll endeavour to get through as many of those as possible during the session. Um, today's session has been recorded and will be available on the Chagas website, uh, the Chagas YouTube channel, and also uh, available as a podcast. So you can enjoy listening to the, the signpost webinar while you're driving or doing some gardening, whatever it might be. So um, that's available on all of the uh, the most popular uh, podcast platforms. So that's great, Ruth. We can see your, your presentation uh, clearly there. So uh, I'll hand over to you and uh, we'll, we'll chat to you afterwards. And um, you can see the screen OK, yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so yes, thank you very much uh, for letting me speak this morning. Um, and I was just going to outline, um, just give a wee outline about the All, Ar the All Ireland Pollinator Plan and um, then just some simple actions or what to look out for on your farm that can help pollinators and wider biodiversity. Um, and just, just to um, thank uh, the Department of Agriculture who fund the, the post um, uh, within the Biodiversity Data Centre um, and supporting the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. So just looking at Ireland and um, the wonderful biodiversity that we have, um, we've over 30,000 species living in uh, 117 habitats, so it is very biodiversity rich in Ireland and um, it's uh, it's uh, wonderful if we can, you know, uh, help that biodiversity because it is in decline and that's a huge problem um, and we depend so much on it. Um, so it's really working with nature um, to help it. Um, the Pollinator Plan has taken pollinators as um, an important element in biodiversity. Um, it's an easy, an easy tool to let us understand um, you know, the impact that we have on pollinators and wider, wider biodiversity. And we can communicate that as a simple, clear message. Um, we can also monitor the changes and um, always protecting pollinators. And it um, it's good for wider biodiversity as well. Um, sometimes it can seem complex what we're talking about when we say to protect um, biodiversity, but uh, it's really um, just to break it down and make it you know, as simple as possible. Just to uh, run through some of the benefits of biodiversity, um, economy and wealth. Um, it's, uh, in Ireland, you would know apples and oilseed rape as benefiting from the, the service of pollination, which is free. 
um, that benefits us, our economy and wealth. For our general health and well-being, then, we get a lovely wide variety of fruit and vegetables that are nice and plump and um, well developed because of pollination and um, because pollination happened. And then the, our wild plants also benefit greatly um, from the service of pollination and uh, that helps them become resilient and also we'll all be familiar with um, the lovely harvest at the end in the autumn that all biodiversity benefits from fruits and seeds. Um, just to say a wee bit about pollinators. Uh, <clears throat> Um, we have over 100 uh, bee species in Ireland. Some people may not be aware of that. Um, so we have one managed honeybee that lives in a, in a hive. Then we have our wild pollinators, which are the majority. Um, we have 21 bumblebees and 80 solitary bees. <clears throat> and um, unfortunately, our wild pollinators are, um, a third of our wild pollinators are threatened with extinction in Ireland. So they're not doing so well and um, the honeybees are doing okay and there's more beekeepers so they're they're actually doing okay in numbers um, and we do a bumblebee monitoring um, project that has shown that decline um, and it's sort of four percent year on year um, a decline um, even common species like the common carder bee is now showing a, a you know a decline um, and some of the rare bumblebees are showing severe decline. And this is really because um, a loss of um, semi-natural habitat uh, in, and uh, just a consequence of how we manage the rest of the lands landscape. Um, so within the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan, then you're be, you may be aware, um, we had, there was the first plan was 2015 to 2020. Um, and we're now on phase two, and that's 21 to 25. Um, the momentum built up in the first plan, and it's just trying to push that forward and keep it going. Um, and it's being supported um, by, you know, government, local communities, um, education authorities as well. So um, a really good momentum. Um, the first objective is uh, farmland, to make farmland more pollinator friendly. And that's the team there. Um, Dr. Una Fitzpatrick is the chair and manager of the pollinator plan um, and myself as the farmland officer. <clears throat> and along the agriculture line, then we have an agribusiness advisor as well for the businesses that are on board. And in, in this new plan, um, we one of my roles is really a lot more direct engagement with farmers out on the ground, chatting to them and um, supplying information, directing them um, to get information um, and training as well and um, develop more evidence-based resources. Um, <clears throat> we'll also be doing, uh, as part of the, the data centre, we do an uh, annual farmland festival. And um, so that takes place in May and definitely one to look out for on social media. Um, and it's a lovely project to get engaged with, engage with and um, support. And it's really just to celebrate the lovely biodiversity, amazing biodiversity that is on farmland. And also the track changes. Um, the project started last year, a pollinator monitoring scheme um, that will be monitoring um, uh, across Ireland how, how our pollinators are doing. I just mentioned a quick, uh, an EIP project, Protecting Farmland Pollinators. Um, it's run out of the National Biodiversity Data Centre and it's looking at whole farm pollinator scoring and um, results based. And uh, there, um, there's a good response. Um, and um, the officer Sorla may come along later to chat to you. Um, but it's really how we can farm, as we farm, be more pollinate, biodiversity and pollinator friendly, um, you know, not to impact on the on the farm business. And there's going to be some lovely resources produced through this project and um, we've already got that week creating solitary bee sites on the farm and um, there's a lovely farmland hoverflies and farmland moths uh, posters so watch out um, for the resources coming from this project. Just to say about our bumblebees and this is our 21 bumblebees um, about eight of them may be more common and the others are, are 
you know, just and they've retracted and are in just certain areas, but uh, a really fantastic, I mean, you know, you wouldn't be surprised, you'd be surprised at how many different types there are. Just to say a wee bit about the bumblebee life cycle. They come out, um, so this is a lovely time actually to be keeping your eyes peeled for them now. Um, they're looking, they come out of hibernation, uh, just, you know, there's been a few spotted already, so definitely a good time to keep an eye out. And um, anything that's flowering early, so willow and dandelion, um, if you look around your farm yourself, you will see those just starting to come out and that's where the pollinators will head. So they need food early. They need a nest site. Then when that queen um, gets her food, she will be looking for a nest site to set up her nest for the year. Uh, she will put food in the nest and um, the young, then she will lay eggs and they will become um, the female workers and she will stay and keep laying eggs and the female workers then will be looking food. Um, after the cycle, um, there's just the, the, a, fresh, a fresh queen bumblebee will hibernate over the winter. So she needs food at the end of the autumn. Um, so late flowering um, ivy, knapweed, anything like that is fantastic. And then <clears throat> she'll find a safe place to hibernate. This is our amazing 80 uh, different types of solitary bees uh, come in all shapes and sizes. And um, once you start looking for them, actually, you're, you know, you get your eye um, homed in. Some can be quite small, but uh, fascinating um, little bees. And again, their life cycle, they come out early um, and they come out at different times and have different food um, uh, different, you know, they'll go for different food. There's early ones are just feeding on willow and then the ones just feeding on ivy. Mm -hmm. um, so nature is all keyed in together. They'll need a nest site. Um, some are cavity nesting. So you could supply um, a log um, and there's details on our website on how to do this um, through the EIP project. And uh, so that's the cavity nesting ones. And then there's a ground, most are ground nesting and um, that we diagram of the tunnel. And um, so she does a little, a little tunnel and puts um, an egg and a little parcel of food in the tunnel and then um, they will, the young will stay there till the next, till now, and they'll be thinking of coming out as it gets warmer. Just to say a wee bit about how far pollinators um, travel, and that helps us understand really why we need to be flower rich across our landscape. Um, so there's the bumblebee can go about a kilometre uh, from, from, the, from the nest site foraging out in general, go about a kilometre. And then the little solitary bee just goes a few hundred metres. Um, so it doesn't fly far. And a study has been done that if the, um, if the solitary bee has to go further, it will reduce how well um, she can uh, produce and rear, you know, have your little um, eggs with a food parcel. So it's very important. Also, just to say, one of the main things is that we need flower in our landscape from early spring to late autumn. So, um, you know, you may think just get summer, lots of flower, but that early flower and that late flower is so important. Um, and those are some of our lovely native species just at the bottom there that uh, with nature's timing, they come out at different times of the year. And just to mention that um, hoverflies, we've over 180 hoverfly species um, and they're very, uh, very varied and um, you would see them around the farm um, if you take a, take a look. Uh, not to compete now with the barn owl from last week, the wonderful barn owl presentation from last week, but um, this little guy is the marmalade hoverfly just on that dandelion and um, he's coined the farmer's friend in the insect world. So that's his larva um, I don't know, you can see it circled in red. Um, so he's an aphid muncher. Um, absolutely, the, the female will um, find the aphids and lay her eggs there. Um, so uh, the wonderful um, uh, predator control for, for the farmers. Um, the, oh, they're so varied and some of them are very important in recycling organic matter as well. Then just to say our wonderful moths as well. They complement the daytime pollinators. Um, if you can think of honeysuckle being lovely and scented in the evening, 
Um, so that's uh, she's the honeysuckle is dependent on bringing in nighttime pollinators. Um, so we have they're complicated as well because they need um, they may need a different uh, caterpillar food and then an, um, nectar and pollen as an adult. Um, so we've got some lovely ones there. The caterpillar of the pebble prominent uh, feeds on willow poplar and the lovely yellow swallowtail then it feeds on you can see that being a real um, hedgerow species, blackthorn, hawthorn, goat willow, elder ivy, and the lovely early thorn there, again, very hedgerow, um, blackthorn, hawthorn. I was just putting up this wee six-spot burnet moth to explain um, that stripy caterpillar will feed on the wee yellow plant, which is bird's foot trefoil. Um, and it's stripy because it's telling birds, uh, it's quite dramatic, you know, don't eat me. Um, because it wouldn't be so good for the birds. So that's its defence as a caterpillar. And then it makes it goes into the lovely little cocoon, the little papery cocoon, and comes out as the uh, adult. And the adult then feeds on, that's on that way there, and it'll also feed on um, vetches and stuff. So um, they need different plants at different times. And then we have um, other insects that help with pollination, butterflies, beetles, wasps, and ants, and um, that you know, will also help with pollination. And then just to see, you know, to look at our landscape and farmland and what has happened um, in the last 50 years, um, we ha it has become less flower rich, um, and that has affected our insect populations. So I'm just gonna go through 10 actions here. I've tried to use as many photos as possible. Um, just so that you can get an idea of what, what uh, we're talking about. And that's to get food, shelter and safety in the landscape. I always say the first thing would be to, you know, get a wee farm map and uh, just see what you have on the farm, because you might be surprised um, what, you know, you may think is just a wee rough area um, is probably, you know, very good for biodiversity. So find the best places on your farm. Semi-natural habitat, that's maybe a big word, but it's just uh, hedgerows, wetlands, woodlands, uh, individual trees, meadows, pastures, anything like that. And it's keep those wee rough areas um, and uh, maintain them. They may need a bit of help, a bit of restoration. And then the last thing would always be to create, um, but it's first to maintain what you have. I just running through some of the habitats there so you get an idea. Um, there's a lovely hawthorn tree that has um, is existing, fantastic uh, uh, tree, and they make a lovely tree. Um, the middle photo there, that's a group of cherry trees, lovely wild cherry trees on top of a tillage field. Um, and that wee corner is just lovely for, for biodiversity and pollinators. And then it depends, your hedgerow might be escaped, uh, you know, or any sort of a hedgerow, fantastic for pollinators and, you know, get it in uh, help and if it needs a wee bit of work um, to make it better for pollinators. Um, wouldn't be so much now semi-natural grassland around, um, but if you have any and even where you look for, look for, you know, it might be in the corner of a field, um, a verge, um, wonderful if you can maintain that, it'd be a top uh, habitat for pollinators. A wee wetland area, now that's um, maybe just a, a bit, uh, that's an old old drain there that's got wooded and lovely marsh marigold, marigold growing in it there. But um, you know, any wetland area is also good, essential for pollinators and biodiversity. Non-farmed areas. Um, I just stuck this one in. Uh, this uh, uh, farmer has um, it, the cow tracks in the farm. He's got some thistles growing there. Um, so it's not being farmed, the area. And um, he actually named one of them Thistle Lane because it was, uh, and the, the bumblebees on, well, there was a bumblebee on every flower, just fantastic. Then just to look at hedgerows, how important hedgerows are and what you're after are thick base, um, uh, foliage to the ground, tall, uh, continuous without gaps. It's so important that um, they form a network really across your farm, sort of like a highway. Um, and that helps, um, it'll help you, you know the value to your livestock with hedge, um, shelter, shade, and, and it helps with soil as well. So they're good for good for us and good for pollinators and wildlife. Uh, you could have a hedgerow tree in it, um, and then margins either side, not cultivated, is also good. It gives that boost to the hedgerow um, and to pollinators and wildlife. 
I've just gone through some of the weed plants. Um, if you're out, this is a lovely time of the year now to be looking into the hedge and see what you've got. Um, usually they're mostly hawthorn, whitethorn and blackthorn would be, hawthorn would be the dominant species. They're, it's fantastic and makes a great hedge. Um, but blackthorn and willow just coming out now, that's those early, that early food that is fantastic for pollinators. Um, I've put a holly in there and um, it's always nice to have a mix. Um, this is some of the plants I've just popped up to, you know, mix in with your hedge. Um, spindle, that's the wee delicate flower of spindle. You would, mightn't see it, but um, you might notice the little fruit at the end of the year, scarlet, pink, and quite, um, you wouldn't think that's a native plant. Uh, so a fantastic wee plant, elder, honeysuckle, gelder, rose dog rose. So it's important if you can incorporate these into your hedge as well. Two species that may be overlooked, um, bramble and ivy. Um, bramble is fantastic. It flowers relatively early and that goes through right to, I've still seen them flowering in October, even November. Um, and if you watch a patch of elder on a sunny bank, uh, a patch of bramble on a sunny bank, um, you hopefully will see bumblebees and they just move from flower to flower. Amazing resource, as is ivy late in the year. And um, if you've ever looked closely into um, an ivy flower, um, they're really quite stunning. So two uh, plants that sometimes we try to control around the hedgerow or farm, um, but if you can leave areas, fantastic. Then just in the management, um, a shape's best that to get that nice thick bottom. Um, and if it's an escaped hedge, there's a this is a wonderful uh, escaped hedge here on, on in the image. Um, and it may be that you, you don't cut it because it's so valuable as it is, or you may need to do a wee side trim um, if, you, if that's what you need on the farm. And moving into the pollinator friendly trees, um, again, I mentioned willow again, um, other wee pollinator friendly trees would be crab apple, again, the hawthorn, I've mentioned that, um, wild cherry as well, and rowan. And that's just the form that um, the pollinator trend, pollinator friendly trees tend to be a nice form. You know, they're a nice, compact, small tree. And um, there's a hawthorn and the cherry willow. Now, the different willows, some can be a bit scruffy or whatever, but this willow here has formed a nice, uh, you know, a nice shaped tree. And um, the round also does, or mountain ash does a lovely um, upright form. So they're handy to, you know, pop in around the farm. I just mentioned the 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 wildflower areas. Um, if if you have a wildflower area, um, fantastic, and uh, we'd love to hear about it or send us a photo or whatever. Um, but they're they're very they're probably not so common now, um, and it's just the the best habitat for pollinators. Um, we've done a wee leaflet that will be on the website just on celebrating the wonderful um, Ireland's lovely meadows and pastures. So have a, have a look at that on our website. Um, and then just really allowing wildflowers to go around the farm. We, we mentioned this non-farmed area. So that's a win-win for, um, for both of us, maybe, you know, just to have those areas. Um, that's a field margin there on a tillage farm, the first image. And they had been cultivating right up to the edge. They've moved out. They see the value now of moved out. Um, and that farm has stopped using insecticide. And um, so uh, that wetland, the third image there, where you see a bit of a, a, a ditch going through the farm. Um, you can see how wild that is, wild and woolly it is in there. So um, that farm is in particularly trying to get uh, habitat for hoverflies and, and um, other species. And um, so they know to leave those areas and um, to let the, in, the, you know, the beneficial insects. Uh, and we may look at an area, I put that little middle picture in. You might think, what's that? You know, it's not very important. But if you look into that, um, that's got some lovely native plants and that is so valuable. And um, you might want to cut and lift it once a year just to keep it going. Um, the last wee image there, uh, it was actually a silo. You know how the, the tires um, on the silo and lo and behold there's a lesser selendine coming through you know so wildflowers pop up everywhere and um, just to be to be valued and I've just put a wee image there that's from some of our resources just on the different wildflowers 
um, that you might just get to see around the farm and to be encouraged if possible. Then just on the nesting, um, the bumblebees, um, they need tussocky grass um, and the, uh, the solitary bees, they go for the cavity, summer cavity nesting and um, bare, bare soil is for the solitary bees. Some of the solitary bees, uh, most of the solitary bees will be bare ground. So that's the type of um, habitat they need. Um, the ERP project has produced this lovely how to create solitary bee nests on your farm, which the farmers have helped to write. So that's a really good resource as well, um, if you're interested. Just to mention about overwintering and also those hoverflies that I mentioned that are so important. Um, uh, what insects need in the winter? They need, um, they need a bit of, um, I would call that, if you call that texture or scruffy, um, so a wee bit of um, habitat there for them to hide away and to protect them in the winter. Um, when that photo there with the ivy, there's an old uh, tree trunk in there. So that's really valuable as well for um, the hoverflies that use wood as their larva stage and also for any that are overwintering as well. Leaf litter, fantastic. Um, the moths and butterflies have the cocoons and the hoverflies, some of them will be in the leaf litter. Um, so I know on edges of farms, you just see leaf litter, just fantastic um, and to be valued really. Um, in your garden as well, maybe not to be so tidy with them. With, um, moving the leaves as well is fantastic and again any wee wetland areas um for the some of the hoverflies that use the um the are aquatic and use uh, wee ditches or whatever and another um action would be to minimize artificial fertilizer and um, so it's it got a wee bit of a boost last year with prices um but just mind where you're applying um the fertilizer um, if you can just move out from the base of the hedge would be fantastic um, you know just to let those areas not not be enriched and it may damage your hedge um, and then there was more interest I suppose last year in the clover lays and multi-species swords um, and herbal lays um, so that we could uh, reduce our inputs um, so that's a win a win-win <laughs> And then I would just say a wee bit about um, pesticide input. Um, the herbicides, um, <clears throat> I don't, I, I wouldn't particularly like that look of um, the, the wee image there of what herbicides does, does to grassland, you know, after you don't see it for a wee while and then um, it just goes brown. And uh, I, I think, do you think people like that? I'm not quite sure why they like it, but, uh, you know, it would have been been easier maybe just to, I'm not sure why you would do it, you know, just get a strimmer out or, um, yeah, it might take it as, as much time as uh, getting the knapsack out. Um, so yes, protect the base of hedge again from um, the any, spray, any spraying and um, any nest sites as well that you can see around your farm, the, any nice um, sunny soil, soil banks or anything. Um, if you could just uh, move away um, from tre treating on any of those. Again, with insecticides, um, if you can reduce the number and frequency of applications, um, that would be fantastic. And, you know, the calm days, um, spray and calm days and use uh, low drift nozzles. And again, um, bees are most active, bees and pollinators are most active um, in the heat of the day, the middle of the day. So try to avoid that time. And if we can just use less, that would be fantastic. They do have an impact on our pollinating insects and biodiversity. And um, just going back to that tillage farm and um, they had stopped using insecticide. And um, these are just some of the wonderful natural predators that uh, they had that, you know, those areas trying to bring in the natural predators. And this wee wasp in the first one, um, it um, sort of mummifies the aphid. Um, so that's that's a little, I found a little aphid um, that it had, uh, um, that's it in a, in a mummified state, state um, from the, the brachinoid wasp. Um, and then ladybirds as well, they have uh, larva that, uh, their larva munch on aphids. So another one to encourage. And I showed you the hoverfly larva, that's the, in the top image there. 
And then just below that, um, the longer, thinner one, that's a lacewing larva. Um, so I did come back and look at this leaf uh, maybe four days later. And where the um, aphids were, it was just a black mush. So they had um, done their job and moved on. Um, just nearly, we're in our, um, just another run nine, action nine. Um, I mean, traditional orchards were in the past near the farmyard and we would have used them um, for, uh, you know, getting, getting crops for the, the home and maybe selling a little. Um, but they're a lovely habitat um, and that those beautiful flowers in the spring, um, that cup shaped flower is just perfect for bumblebees. Um, so good source of nectar and pollen. And um, then we've got good pollinators around. We will get a good crop and they're low intense uh, management. So you can get nice grassland below and maybe with a hedgerow, some crab apples nearby as well to help pollinate the your apple trees. Um, they would need cross pollinated to get those good crops. So a lovely habitat to have, a, have around your farm. Um, and just uh, one that you may not think, but the farm garden, it can also be a lovely refuge for pollinators. Um, and you could even have some native plants within it. I mean, the bird's fruit trefoil looks wonderful. Um, I, I would replace it in the rockery any day. Um, so just what you, you do in your garden is also can be, you know, beneficial um, and some farms have, you know, you have a wee bit of space more and you've had a nice garden. So um, even a little wildflower area, even a little, you know, you could do a little meadow area on your lawn and um, save you time. Uh, no, no cutting every every week and, um, you know, just cut and lift at the end as well. And we we'll just direct you to pollinators.ie and our farmland section. Um, lots of resources in there and videos and we guides as well. Um, and we also did seasonal actions that you can take for pollinators on the farm. And if you would like to monitor um, any of the pollinator species, this would be your little basic uh, sort of thing that you could do. It's an app that you can download, a flower insect time count. And it will guide you through and there's information also on the National Biodiversity Data Centre website just on how you can um, do, do that count. Um, so if there's a, you know, maybe you want to try uh, monitoring your hawthorn every spring and that could just, you know, you can see how, how well you do. You just 10, 10 minutes and you don't have to be an expert, um, you just very basic. Um, so it's a lovely wee way just to see, well, is the hawthorn doing better this year than last year? So just the encouragement to give, you know, lots of small actions taken together um, can really help solve um, the big problems of our biodiversity loss. And just to thank um, Chagas for their support, especially Catherine um, has been um, so valuable and um, the Department of Agriculture then for, for supporting, uh, for support. And I'll just finish off if there's any, um, that's contact details and the website again. And um, that's me. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, a really excellent pr presentation there and, and easy to follow and nice to see some 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 a lovely exposition of the, the amazing biodiversity that we have in this country. Who would believe 31 and a half thousand different species that we have in this country? Mm -hmm. it, it really is a reminder of, of the, the the wealth that we have in, in our countryside. Um, just a reminder to everybody, we have a Q&A tab uh, at the bottom of your screen there. Please do US, use it. Um, and I should have told you, Ruth, before we, we started, we have a very informed audience uh, joining us uh, every mo uh, every Friday morning. And so I can see already the really insightful questions coming through. So do keep them coming. Um, and uh, a special welcome to our audience joining us from across Europe as well. I see we have people from, from Zagreb, Germany, Brussels, and... Uh, uh, all over Ireland, of course, as well. So uh, very, you're you're all very welcome this morning. Just if I could start off, Ruth. I mean, you talked about the um, the endangered species or the threatened uh, the species that are threatened with extinction. Uh, I think you said one third of our our bees are, are um, threatened with extinction. How how urgent or how imminent is that uh, an issue for for Ireland? Um. Well, that um, it is worrying that continual decline, you know, and there 
the, some of them are getting more isolated, um, which is never good. You know, you want that, that they need to be moving around. Um, so um, anything that we can do now is is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is that, you know, death by a thousand cuts or whatever, you know, it's just that gradual. So, uh, yeah, anything that we can do. And it's just small actions, really. If everyone's doing it across the landscape, that's just so beneficial. And it is, look, we, we sometimes forget, we, we hear about climate crisis, uh, but uh, we are also in a biodiversity crisis that uh, yeah, is yeah. sometimes yeah. Uh, overlooked. Um, uh, Catherine, a uh, lot of really excellent questions coming through there, but maybe maybe could you tell us about your own role there in the, the uh, All-Ireland uh, Pollinator Plan and, and uh, what what's happening from a Chagas perspective? Well, I suppose I just represent Chagask on the steering group from the beginning and uh, support Una, Una, Dr. Una Fitzpatrick and, and, and Jane Stout from Trinity are, were the two who, who led this initiative. And, um, you know, there's a body, a, a group then on the steering group which support them and help them. But of course, Chagask has a huge role in, in, in getting the message out to the right people uh, on the farmland side. The All Ireland Pollinator Plan obviously covers lots more than farmland and is extremely valuable there because I think the problem we often face in farmland is that people see things being done in tidy towns and by councils and assume that that's the right thing so we need farmers for us to progress in farming we need the general public to understand and the All-Ireland Pollinator Plans works with all those different groups so if everybody understands then why the farmer is leaving the the margin you know to grow rather than spraying it or, or having it as a lawn um, then they understand it's not you know a lazy farmer so I, I've always found that you know farmers do what they think others want them to do um, so that's I think the real value of the pollinator plan is the widespreadness of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I've I've seen uh, some photos on Twitter of of uh, the the, uh, the the yellowed grass around uh, along verges, and uh, I've I've seen other farmers calling it out, in fact, and saying, "Look, this isn't necessarily the the way to go." So um, so it's good to see that level of aware of awareness out there. Um, Ruth, just uh, before we go to questions, you mentioned a, a festival of biodiversity that's taking place uh, in at the start. Is it uh, the May? Um, Bank holiday weekend is that the month of May. The month of oh, the month of May. So the, yes. from the first of uh, the thirty first of May. Um, have you any details you can share with us at this stage? No, just keep a look out on social media. Uh, okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. No, that, that 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 that's maybe something we can look at closer to yes. the date. Um, so, Catherine, uh, questions really excellent yeah, questions that's, coming through that's there. Questions, and I suppose the the the, the old chestnut uh, Ruth coming through. Uh, they have been so inspired by the lovely pictures of the meadows you have shown. People want to plant them. So, what planting on farms? Um, can you comment or give our give your recommendations on that planting flowers on farms? Uh, the pollinator plan wouldn't recommend that you plant. Um, we would recommend you know a uh, a low input and um, so um, just you know move back from the area stop um, putting um, any enrichment in it or any um, pesticides and uh, cut and lift um, cut and lift and just patience and um, see if it will develop and uh, it will it will have some plants pop up that farmers may not be so fond of but it's just to give it time and you know let it uh, the enrichment go out of out of it. And a related mm -hmm. question, Ruth. Um, sometimes people, if they have inherit or, or come across those beautiful fields, they think we'll put a fence around them and we let them we won't touch them. Um, can you comment on the need for the management? Yeah, I think you touched on it in your talk that they need um, species rich grass yeah. and our pasture. Yes. Yeah. Um, if it's good, you gotta go look at what what how you've been managing it, you know, because we do have the knowledge and um obviously that who the farmer has been has been managing it in the right way. So I would continue that management. Um if it's cut and lift, um usually at the end of the season, if the farmer wants to take a hay crop, it's usually um July that that would be cut and lift. Um and then if it's an area that you want um, you know, it you know, just depends on what what the what the farmers do and um, 
but the later will be more beneficial to pollinators. But uh, you know, we have to work with you know with Act. farmers. Okay. But the, but the key point is that it, it does need to be cut or it will turn into scrub and you lose the flowers, is it? Yes, yes. Yeah. And another very good question, um, not so much on the meadows, but maybe on those um, areas around the farm. At what time should you trim, you know, the growth on these, let's call them margins or something, to minimise interference with invertebrates in dormancy? You know, if um, you... Yeah. Um, well, if you're the field margin... Um, a sunny you know a sunny field margin is going to be the best for the feeding pollinators um so you if we would recommend end of the season sort of september cut and lift if that's possible or um move the fence back and let it gray you know graze off whatever's handy for their system um then the north the north side then um, you know you could leave an area that you're just cutting them every every other year you know or and um, that's where the hibernating insects would would head you know the cooler uh, parts of the field margin um, so that they don't wake up too early in spring um, but the, the cut and lift's great on the sunny margin um, you know just to let that develop. But I suppose I'm also thinking about and I think the person is thinking about you know farm roadways as you drive into farm you'd have laneways you know not not part of the field margins let's say the general areas and this would be very relevant to the general public and your garden um but the same message maybe leave it uh, you saw that we saw that beautiful picture of the bumblebee going to nest in the grass yes so some long grass is good so that's where yeah. you're every second yeah. year yeah okay that base but, of the hedge is just you know yeah. it's the business so that's, really that's um, the and if you can head. come Sorry, but I was just the, the when you yeah. see that grass and the bumblebee looking for it, and you're worried. Then have we cut it because we're, you know, um... any wee scruffy corners are great. Um, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So a variety, I suppose. Cut yeah. it, yeah. Tussocky grass is the business yeah. as well, and uh, yeah, yeah. We have a question coming through that I, I think maybe both of you could comment on. It's one we have quite regularly around the the uh, commercially available pollinator friendly wildflower seed mixes that often contain unsuitable and non-native species um and what what's your view on those uh on introducing them maybe ruth if you could start um it's probably not necessary uh so i um see what you've got work with, with what you've got um and our insects are quite complicated really you know they need um they need our native species they're adapted to our native species and they want the food from um, you know, they need it all, all year round. They just don't need a big boost of colour in the summer. Um, so it's definitely just to see, work what you've got with what you've got and a wee bit of patience and see, you know, what, what happens. Yeah, and I suppose I'd add to that because I've, I've, I found that so frustrating. It started me doing my weekly um, comments on, on growing wild to value what we have um yeah. growing yeah. part of our natural biodiversity because the biggest problem i find with the message about planting something is that you're replacing something that is already we're not valuing what's there and i suppose that could i ask ruth another question there about you again we saw some lovely flowery pictures but can you comment on um the value of some of maybe the more ugly looking <laughs> plants um that are native and that are there I presume do all plants um have a value for invertebrate in pollinators or the or, yes. or other biodiversity perhaps because I know you're very keen to push that we're absolutely. not just talking pollinators absolutely I mean um, nature's so in tune isn't it uh we can't even understand how complex it is really after all you know uh, all this and everything has a wee niche um, so some of those caterpillars just feed on certain plants. Um, and I always would push um, bramble and ivy, which, uh, you know how it is on the farm that you just want to, you know, clean up that wee corner. Um, but uh, just this season, even if you have a wee bramble area on a sunny day, um, just see how much, you know, how, how many pollinators are on it. It's one, I think it's one of the species on the fit count, or you could do your wee fit count, you know, flower insect time count, 10 minutes, just count how many are feeding on it. Um, so yeah, you might have to clear it in some places and stuff, but uh, you know, we corner a bramble oh, in a sunny in a sunny area it would just be fantastic for pollinators. And then that ivy later in the season, it's actually critical to our bumblebees. And um, they're just trying to you know beef up before they go to sleep for the winter. So um, there's not much in flower, uh, maybe a bit of knapweed, maybe a bit of late vetch, but uh, the ivy um, just fantastic amount of uh, food for the late pollinators. 
so all have their value and yes, uh, yes. A, a, probably a simple question for you to answer is it possible to buy pollinators and um, particularly likes of hoverflies and introduce them i wouldn't recommend that at all I, um you get the habitat right and they will they've got wings especially hoverflies they um do amazing even those little marmalade hoverflies migrate uh from Europe um, when the wind is right. So um, no need to introduce. And um, your, your, main, your main priority is to you know, have a wee bit of species with, you know, of flower rich habitat and um, the pollinators will move in. Would you have a concern for promoting um, forestry on agriculture and marginal land, um, which, could over, which could be the, the more flower rich existing meadows? Um, well, yes, um, any area that would be planted, um, you would have to take care, you know, what uh, criteria you were using to where you plant trees. Yeah. Um, so, yep, some habitats are, um, you know, they'd be too valuable, you know, as semi-natural habitat to um, plant. So you would just have to take care where you plant. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of uh, focus. It's just a, a remark or an observation. There, we we focus a lot on the the pollination um, function of of these uh, species, but then you know, the, often these species are food for for other uh, animals up the, the the food chain as well. I know. Uh, uh bats for example you know you know yeah, bats yeah. are a, a very yeah. important food source for them and and that interconnectedness is yeah. it just uh can't be underestimated yeah um, you get a good healthy insect population and then that's for the birds the bats and then for the, <clears throat> the higher species as well <clears throat> so yes it's um it's all it's all connected and linked in yeah Ruth, you had a lovely fact there about the 300 metres and somebody's wondering, is that the, um, are flowers within that okay or is there something about 150 metres, you know, is it the closer the better or? The um, they, don't, they don't fly far, um, so you just need to, make, you know, just if we have, um, it's sort of continual flower rich areas, you know, not just isolated um, and there's, you know, there will be variation, but they've sort of given an estimate that they only fly about 300 metres from their nest. Um, and if they have to fly further, um, research has been done to say, you know, they're not as successful, um, you know, at that, that season. Um, as you can imagine, they're, they're using more energy to go and get food, so they'll be not able to um, lay as many eggs or have enough of those little pollen baskets that they you know, they put with the eggs. So it's just stressing them a wee bit more if they have to go further. Can you comment on um, the the current work that's fencing off water courses or even dry drains, you know, that may hold water at some stage and um, that the value or they're likely to have, um, you know, for, for sheltering for, yeah, any values fencing off those areas on, as we're doing under acres? Yeah. Um, that's the tussocky areas and um, trees may establish, you know, you might get willow and um, if it's wet, uh, willow in there. So yes, they, those areas will um, will help uh, pollinating insects and uh, wider biodiversity. And I think um, the question is for the, uh, the, the uh, nest sites as well, could they yes. be useful? What's that? Sorry, Catherine. Yeah, it could be. Could they be useful as nest sites? Yes, the tussocky grass, the bumblebees, um, and then you'll get a bit of deadwood in there. Um, I think I get laughed at because I'm very into deadwood, but um, a lot of our insects need that uh, deadwood as part of their life cycle. Um, so it's never to be too 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 keen on the tidying up of um the deadwood as well and the leaf litter as well. Um, you know, <clears throat> very <clears throat> very essential really in the landscape. Question here, uh, Ruth, around the value of uh, furs and bracken uh, for biodiversity. Um, how 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 would you rate uh, th those as a uh, for as food for pollinators? Um, the the furs, uh, yes, that has um, the the um, flowers are long long season. You know, they come out. There's some out now. Um, yes, that will that will supply. Um, a Food for pollinators, um, the bracken, um, not not so much for pollinators. There is no uh, food value in it for pollinators. 
I would have imagined so. Yeah. And just just while while we're you, you mentioned the the that the, the, some of the furs of the the, the gorse uh, flowering. I mean, the, this changing of seasons or earlier budding uh, is that is that something the National Biodiversity uh, Data Center is concerned about or? monitoring yes. um, the, I probably the should impact have mentioned of that, that um, the farmer's wildlife calendar it's happening now so if um wonderful if you can put your um records in of when um willow first uh i actually don't remember the species um but if you go on to the national biodiversity farmer's wildlife cal calendar and the, well, the blackthorn is what will be one of them and it's just when those things are starting to flower and um i think it's on its third or fourth year now and then we'd be able to build up information on, you know, what changes. Um, and we, yeah, we would be concerned, you know, if those change so much um, and when insects come out, uh, you know, just with a bit of, is the term climate chaos, you know, just with a wee bit of change uh, mm -hmm. predicted for the future. Mark, um, I just wanted to follow on from your gorse and your, your uh, yes. on to the real baddies. And I could Ruth comment on, uh, our invasive alien species. Um, I'm not sure if rhododendron is good. That's what the question is. But I would further to because I know Himalayan balsam. The the bees love it. So what's that conundrum? We have these really baddies in the landscape. Are they good for bees? And are bees <laughs> encouraging them to keep pollinating them? Um, well, our stand in, on that would be you know um, if you can control them and remove them, that would be. Um, uh, more beneficial as a whole to biodiversity uh, in the landscape. Um, yes, they may get some food from it, but um, they you would call them bullies. <laughs> so they're knocking out our native species and um, they just keep going. Um, so it's good to get them quick, um, you know, not let them get established because it can be, a, you know, so much work to, to control them um, and be careful how you control them and um, go to a uh, the data center invasives uh, section and um, lots of information on what you can do there um, but it's definitely you know and there's other impacts they can have and um, for example the um the balsam if it's on a they like the wet and if it's on a river bank or whatever and um, it it it's like um it's related to the busy lizzie you know such so as melts in the winter and that can leave your river bank exposed you know, and cause problems. So you, whereas our native vegetation would stay put and nice root structure and keep a nice firm bank. So um, nip it in the bud, I would say, anything that's popping up <laughs> that's uh, on that line. Just a question for Catherine and, and Ruth, you might want to join in on this one, but it, it, what sort of financial supports are available to farmers for, for creating habitats or... Um, supporting biodiversity on their farms we have i know the the acres is yeah, is probably the main vehicle for that with the acres i mean at the end of the day it covers so many farmers and farmland and uh again ruth might be interested to, uh, to comment because i'm not sure if she knows the details i mean i'd be very familiar with them and i'd be very happy with um the actions in particular the the move towards the grass margins fencing off the margins along hedges i don't know how popular it will turn out to be it's i'm a big ad advocate of it going following on from what ruth is saying but you know fencing off the, the margins um and fencing off the water courses like just leaving space leaving space to nature and then managing it cutting all right so acres is the big one um ruth any other other sources of help for farmers financially no acres as um yeah there's the hedges the margins and there's a there was a the option for traditional orchard you know establishing a traditional orchard if beautiful and um, you wanted um so yeah there's um just de de definitely to okay. get advice if that would suit your farm yeah and i think the point should be also made that uh, a lot of these measures don't cost a lot of money and uh absolutely you know, mm -hmm. that uh yeah. maybe it's a case of just uh just being a wee bit more aware yeah yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely so uh, just uh, the role of beech hedges not a native where does that fit in for for bees it, that it'll not benefit pollinators as much there is there's no um flower or food you know food value there for the pollinator um so yeah just those native species um are are wonderful um the there was a question about the design of ponds now but in general water courses and ponds i suppose they provide a different suite of flowers so while water isn't 
necessarily related to pollinators as it would be for mayflies or you know other invertebrates. I assume water in the in the creation of ponds and that would diversify plant species and be good for bees. Any comment? Yeah, wetland plants are a fantastic source okay. of food for pollinators, and then um, those are hundred and eighty hoverflies. Uh, we haven't really appreciated those as much in the landscape to now, and quite a few of them have aquatic larva stage. So yeah, water is very important to pollinators. Yeah. Are there posters available showing the bumblebees and solitary bees? Um, yes, there are. You can go to our website. Um, there's those two posters that I showed in the presentation. Um, you can download them or if um, we, I'll be taking some of them around some of the events this year. So have a look out for the pollinator plan, any of the, the Chagas events or, uh, or the likes or plan championship. Yeah, maybe that's something we should consider because I know some people, a lot of people have inquired as to where they can get access to the to those posters. So yeah, maybe we could we could use our our Chagas network to to uh, to 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 get some of them out as well. Maybe that, that could be something we could do. Um, look, we're we're coming close to the end of the the session, and uh, but with just a few few last questions there. Um, that does does you know request uh, for information about the removal of furs there is that still required uh, for farmers to remove furs um, or is it now recognized as an important pollinator friendly species um, there's been quite a few changes around that whole um, ineligible spaces on farms Catherine maybe you'd like to comment yeah. on that yeah I think the this year the, the the schemes will will allow more areas um on the farm up to 50 percent of a parcel um which may not be eligible will me mean the parcel will be eligible so that's a huge change I suppose far as I don't know would Ruth agree like furs can be good but I don't know that we want areas uh, furs can be invasive too and nothing else grow so while furs are a hedgerow plant and they are native um, it's a bit like um, hazel and burn. We don't want to see too much of anything. Would that be fair, Ruth? Yeah, yeah. Um, and just in the wrong place as well. If it's, uh, you know, it can if get, I think that's thing. why it gets out of, yeah. uh, you know, out of balance. So, yeah, just be careful. Um, and, uh, yeah, might need to be kept in check. OK, great. Well, look, I think we have got through most of the questions this morning. So, uh, sincere thanks to everybody who submitted really excellent questions this morning. Ruth, uh, thank you very much for really excellent pre presentation. Lots of common compliments coming through in the, 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 the Q&A session as well, uh, part of this morning. So, and Catherine, thank you very much for your really insightful uh, <clears throat> uh, knowledge with all of these, uh, this this area. You've been working this area a long time, so it's uh, it's great to have the, your experience uh, both with the the actual science and, and also the, the policy and scheme side of things. It's 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 great to have that uh, that knowledge available to us. Um, just to say uh, thank you to to Vaughan Maher in the background and Andy Boland and Pat Murphy, uh, our, our series uh, coordinators. And next week we'll be joined by Daniel Hen from Solahead Farm uh, attached to Chagas Moor Park. And he, he'll be Daniel will be talking about scenarios exploring the national herd and grassland management targets to achieve climate targets. Uh, so that's uh, next Friday morning. So uh, with that, I want to say thanks again to everybody for joining us and uh, we'll see you next Friday. So enjoy the weekend. Thank, Thank you very much. much.